Good afternoon. Um, so we're going to have an amazing panel, but I'm going to very quickly just um, run through a little bit of a primer, if you like, a summary of, of actually some of the things that have already been said this morning um, around hybrid hospitality. And then with the panel, we'll just discuss on, okay, what actually is it? What does it mean? How can we get the most out of it? So there's a few drivers when it comes to uh, hybrid hospitality. Like I said, a lot of this has been talked about already before, so I'm going to go really quickly through this. Um, especially younger generations love experiences. We at Skift Research do a lot of research amongst consumers. We continuously see that people would rather spend money on traveling than, than on things at their home. They rather have experiences than things, as was said this morning by Tom as well. Um, Rising loneliness, again, something that was mentioned this morning. This is US data uh, showing how the hours per week spent with friends have, has drastically reduced over the last couple of uh, years or decade. Um, and so people are looking for connection when they're traveling. Um, housing has become completely unaffordable. Um, compared to 2015, which is that uh, black dotted line uh, where house prices were. Pretty much every country in the OECD region now has higher housing prices than it did before. So people can't actually afford to buy a house anymore. So what do they do? They spend more on other things, um, including traveling. Space optimization, something that's uh, mentioned before as well and, and is obviously extremely important also when we start to think about the environmental impact that real estate is having and making sure that we use it uh, to the best of our ability. An office tends to be open from 8 a.m. to 6 p.m., so a lot of underutilized uh, capacity there. And actually, according to some research by density, even in between, in, in those hours, actually most offices are only open for two thirds, or actually utilized for two thirds of that time. Um, a hotel obviously has a similar problem, um, or actually an inverse problem, where um, most people uh, sign in or check in at around 4 p.m., um, check out at about 10 a.m., and for the rest of the day, um, a lot of that space isn't being utilized. Obviously, hotel rooms need to be cleaned, um, but there is less foot traffic, and there's a, an opportunity that is there to, to utilize the spaces better, especially during the day. And finally, we've got the trend or the driver of working from anywhere. Um, we've done a lot of research, especially during the pandemic, where we ask consumers, are you working from home? Um, what is your working um, uh, life looking like? And actually consistently, the amount of people that are working fully remote since the pandemic actually hasn't changed at all. So still now, um, more than a quarter of people are working completely from home. Um, and we are seeing a little bit of a shift um, to a bit more of a hybrid model, but actually pretty much the, the, the amount of people that still work completely in an office um, hasn't changed at all. And, and most people either work fully from home or have some sort of hybrid uh, working environment today. And that has obviously an impact on travel. And that's where we obviously want to go to. So um, with people having more flexibility, they are able to travel more. And we, we see in our service that that actually is the case. I hope you can see those light gray from where, <laughs> where you're sitting. Um, People are traveling longer, taking more long trips, but also taking uh, more short trips. And we've seen this over the last years uh, growing. Um, we also see that business travel has changed. Um, it's not just, um, um, it's, it's not just a, a small group of road warriors or salespeople that are traveling. There's a, we, we call it the socialization of business travel. You see more staff retreats, um, coming together, off-sites, um, to be able to, to facilitate working more remote. But also, what we're seeing is, is blended travel, pleasure, however you want to call it. So business trips that contain a weekend have gone up considerably. And on the right here, you see uh, what Deloitte calls laptop, laptop luggers. So these are people that go on a, a leisure trip, but then are taking their laptop with them so that they can extend their leisure trip by a few days if they work a few days from their destination. And what that means is that we've seen um, a whole host of, of obviously hotel companies um, starting to, to play to that. And this happened before the pandemic as well, of course, right? Um, we've seen many mixed use um, um, brands coming into this space. Um, and, and since the pandemic, actually, the larger brands are now also 
starting to pay attention, and, and the latest additions are, are Hilton with its uh, workspaces, and uh, Marriott has a day pass now. So it's actually going very mainstream, but probably also just transforming a little bit, um, whereas these very disruptive brands are still there, the larger brands are now taking heed as well. That's not the only thing that's, that's changing. Also, the booking behavior has changed. This is a, one of my favorite quotes, actually, from uh, Brian Chesky. He's the CEO of Airbnb, as I'm sure you all um, have heard of. 40% um, of people, this was during the pandemic, he told, he told this at Skift's forum, 40% uh, of people come to Airbnb and they either have no destination or date range in mind. I mean, that's, that's mind-boggling. So um, they completely changed their website. There's no more search bar where you have to type in the destination. Uh, you, can, you can explore what destination you want to go to. You can say you're flexible with your dates. Uh, you can do a long stay, short stay. Now they have categories um, of different types of properties. They've completely changed their entire website based on the idea of people are more flexible in the choices they're making, and they don't necessarily want one thing or the other based on the type of trip they're making. And it also means that short-term rentals and hotels are converging more. Um, so we're seeing Marriott introducing hotels or homes and villas and now also apartments as, as two separate brands. Um, we're seeing Sonder, which really started out as a, as a master lease uh, short-term rental provider, now offering pretty much hotel standard services that don't really distinguish it from any, any other hotel anymore. So there's a lot of blurring going on there, not just in, in how people travel, but also in how the industry itself um, is being marketed and, and, and represented. And obviously, um, technology needs to play a part there as well, and we'll talk in the panel about that. So um, we, as an industry, probably are still very much on these going from this old DOS system to maybe newer systems. Obviously, now we're starting to talk about AI, what's the impact of AI going to be on this as well? And um, I really want to talk with the panel about um, whether technologies that is out there today can help, can, is good enough for them to operate their business as they, as they want. So um, I want to welcome the panel to the stage now. Uh, Kevin, Hans, Eric, and Navneet, please give them a warm welcome. That's okay. I'll go here. Ah, Great. Yeah. Okay, cool. That works. Okay. All right. Thanks, guys. It's a very meal heavy panel, but it is. We'll work on that for next year, I guess. Vocation. Um, <laughs> um, so, thanks, every, thanks all for being here. Also, thanks everyone in the audience. Please help me out with, with uh, questions on, slide a, on Slido. Um, we've heard quite a bit about hybrid hospitality already this morning, so I kind of want to know from you guys what you really want to want to hear about. So um, put those questions in and we'll, we'll get to that. Um, I want to start just understanding the concept of hybrid hospitality. I guess everyone has a different, different opinion on it. Um, Hans, I want to start with you, because if there's a, um, I guess, a hotel disruptor um, Supremo, then it's probably you. Um, you even have a problem with having a hotel bed in the center of, of your hotel room, which, I mean, it worked for a century. What, what's going on there? What, why, why are you um, having such an issue with that? With what? Exactly. With, with a hotel bed in the middle of uh, your hotel, hotel room. Um, well, the interesting thing is that sometimes innovation is not that complicated. If you see that 99.9% .9 of the hotel rooms or studio apartments have the bed in the middle of the space, you can think about, okay, can we change that? And I think that was basically the tagline of uh, the brand launch of Zoku, where we said, this is the end of the hotel room as we know it. Uh, given the fact that if you need a hotel room between the late night dinner and early flight the next morning, then sleeping is most of the time the most important activity there. But if you stay in a city for longer periods, a few days, weeks, then uh, other functions become very much important. You even might want to invite somebody into your space or even have a meeting over there. And then if the, bit, the bed is in the middle of the space, that feels a little bit awkward. Sure, so what you, because you told me, you, so, so the idea is to replace 
the bed for a table. Yeah, the, the uh, what we try to achieve with, uh, uh, with Zoku is to create a place where people could uh, live comfortably but also work efficiently at the same time. And especially a lot of people, well, now we talk about digital nomads, we've seen your know, grass would work from anywhere. So what we see is that our lifestyles really start to blur while our spaces were st still very monofunctional. And then if you talk about um, hybrid, uh, we all start to learn about the theme mixed use. However, we want to take it even a step further into multi-use. So our idea of the space is that you can do different things in the same space. And what was interesting is before COVID, we used the Zoku Loft, which is basically our room type, as a hotel room and a service department. But uh, during COVID, a lot of companies that actually didn't allow their people to go to the office. So we had a big deal with a tech company here in Amsterdam, and they said, given the fact that the bed is hidden and the kitchen table is there, can our people work there? So they started to use this space for private meetings, uh, for private office space or for a meeting space. And we even challenged it even more. So we built the biggest collection of Michelin star restaurants where people got served a four course Michelin star dinner in their lofts. There's always also a full kitchen over there, so they were invited via Zoom with Joris Beidijk, which is a Dutch head chef, to basically prepare together with him a meal in that loft, and then we had live music in the corridor at the end of the evening. So for us, it was a big way of experimenting what can we do uh, differently with space. Also, I think your graph that you just showed about the office and the hotel, those are all monofunctional buildings. And we feel there's a huge opportunity to change that. Mm, interesting. Uh, Kevin, I just want to ask you, I guess you're a bit more of a traditional hotelier, if, if I might say that. Um, but at the same time, you're, you're working a lot on, on diversifying your revenue streams as well. Um, uh, I think Accor, you're, you're French, you, you're well aware of Accor. They, they call it augmented hospitality, I think. I don't know if that's exactly the concept as you see it. But explain to us what, what uh, Mashafer is, is doing and what your, you stand for. So I think you're right in saying that um, we are more of a traditional uh, hospitality company. The company is already 30, 31 years old. And, um, and so I, I think I can speak uh, as, a, as, a, as a hotelier that uh, doesn't have the uh, advantage of the, or the opportunity to design hybrid hospitality uh, uh, to start with, but, to having, but, ha but having to migrate from traditional, let's say, hospitality with the bed at the center of the room, which is at the center of the customer journey, which has to be sold to the customer. But, something in the lines of really diversifying um, uh, revenue streams. And so it's true that uh, for us, um, hybridization is, uh, is, is um, we define it two ways. First is space optimization, or actually rethinking space. Uh, during COVID, we actually uh, uh, had 35 rooms in one of our hotels that were transformed in stores, mini boutiques. So think of, a, instead of like a room, uh, sorry, room, uh, a street with different, um, you know, commerces and um, uh, different retail stores, we actually had hotel corridors with different rooms and different partners uh, from a spa to like, uh, a little, like me, almost a dentist. We actually had a dentist one that actually asked us to come, uh, to come in and occupy space. So um, that was one, 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 um, one example of diversification. The other one was uh, uh, rethinking entirely the lower grounds of, of some of our hotels. Um, we like uh, venturing out into the food and beverage industry and we um, started specifying into the whole speakeasy segment. Um, so more the B aspect than the F aspect. Uh, food is really an industry that is tough to understand and capture, but beverage is something when you um, uh, actually look at it uh, economics-wise, it can be quite profitable and you can really leverage either like back of the house space or lower ground spaces. So we were the first to open a, a CBD cocktail bar right before COVID. Uh, we also have a miscaleria, so uh, basically a, a hidden speakeasy behind the kitchen of our, of our hotel. So yeah, looking at different spaces uh, that we can uh, uh, actually leverage to bring value to, first of all, the ADR from a traditional perspective of, of looking at things. Obviously, increasing the TREF bar uh, because the customer journey uh, later on becomes more intense with more touch points where you can sell, uh, sell um, different experiences. Uh, so that's one way of looking at hybrid. The other way, and very briefly, um, is, is looking at what segments constitute hos uh, hospitality today. Mm -hmm. And I think this is what I understood from how you define um, hybrid hospitality is, is blurring the lines, right? Um, and, and, and for us, experiential travel um, is one, used to be one segment. Um, classic hospitality used to be another segment. Then a fully like economic, you know, um, uh, economical and economic um, segment with tech used to be another segment. We want to try and blur that a little bit um, and, and by being the 
perfect use case of traditional hospitality, moving towards future uh, by blurring the lines between all that. And we believe in immersiveness to address that. So having tech power uh, a great customer journey, but in a very traditional, very Parisian landscape, because we have most of our hotels in Paris. Uh, so we don't want to kill tradition. We don't want to kill culture. Uh, we don't want to kill what is uh, mm -hmm. our DNA, our soul. And so we just believe more in blurring the lines um, uh, from a customer journey, uh, from an experiential perspective, but not from a, a product perspective. Yeah. Um, Navneet, I just want to pull you in. You, you, you work in the hostel space. Um, you, can, you can explain what, what you're working on now, but uh, obviously came from Miningr. And, um, I don't know if it's fair to say, but probably not an area that is known for its amazing F&B <laughs> offering, but um, you, you've been very disruptive as well in that space. So tell us what you're, what you're working on now and what you're seeing. Yeah, so you mentioned uh, my prior, uh, prior background and you in hybrid hospitality. So I just want to mention that uh, you know, we were the first company in the world, actually, to call anything hybrid. Mining or you, when you were yes, in mining. Yes, in 2012. Yeah. Nobody actually called it hybrid hospitality. So we didn't invent the word hybrid, it's a common noun, mm -hmm. but we used it for the first time in the context of hospitality. And the reason for, for that was, and it'll come to my new brand, is because it combines a hotel and a hostel in one space. And when I took over that company in 2012, half the guys within the company said, are we a hostel or are we a hotel? And in fact, some of the hotels were called hotels and some are called hostels. Mm -hmm. And there was this huge confusion as to what, what are we actually? And there was this whole idea within our industry that everything is a silo. You know, you're either this or that. And actually I said to my team, I drive a hybrid car, which is a Prius at that time. You know, the car industry can call it hybrid, we should call it a hybrid hotel. And that makes sense because, you know, hotels is a very large and all-encompassing, you have all suite hotels, you have resort hotels, you have budget hotels, you have luxury hotels, so hostel is a kind of a hotel, but actually it's, it has some distinctions. So coming to, you know, coming, so that's the hybrid idea that you can combine things you know, in one format within the same context of one building. And the real reason is, is, is basically something which is good for the customer because he can book a bed if he wishes to, share the bed, not the bed, sorry, share the room <laughs> with somebody that he, wow. doesn't, <laughs> he doesn't know, or he can... Uh, I'm sure there's been some bed shares. <laughs> yeah, I, I do hope so. <laughs> so, so, uh, so that's the idea behind sharing. If you like, you can share that space, you can book a bed in, uh, in Berlin at the, uh, the Hauptbahnhof, where we had a uh, product there for 32 euros a night, or you can book a room, which is a private room, like a regular hotel, a budget hotel, for 80 euros, 100 euros. So you're flexible. So it's flexibility is the hallmark of this whole thing. Yeah. So when I left Meininger two, two years ago with the pandemic, I got an opportunity to buy a building which had to be, which actually was a former Meininger hotel in Frankfurt without a brand. And I created a year ago this brand called Live In. So it's Live In. It's a combination of a hybrid hotel and hostel mm -hmm. like Meininger, but also adds extended stay to it something your slide pointed out, that yep. people are spending more time. So it's basically something for, I think, taking into account what's happening in the world, but essentially flexible accommodation, using space efficiently, particularly the public spaces, with communal facilities, so that, you know, just like, uh, you know, the, the pioneer of communal facilities is sitting here. And I've taken ideas from everybody that I think is good in the industry and absorbed them like a magpie to see whether we can create something which is uh, good for investors, good for customers, but the hallmark is flexibility. It's flexible in its approach, it uses space very efficiently, and my focus has always been, and I've been advocating it, that the industry should look at revenue and profit per square meter, and not just about rev par and yeah. other things. So let, that's let the me, focus. I'll, I'll come back to that in a second. Yeah. I just want to pull Eric in as well. Uh, um, you, obviously, Oki, one of the, um, best, I don't know if I'm allowed to say that, best uh, upsell, you're, you're allowed I'm allowed to say that, I suppose, <laughs> uh, upselling tools in, in the hotel industry. You must be talking to a lot of hoteliers, so um, are you seeing that um, uh, people are, or, or that hoteliers are more interested in hybrid ways of using space, and, and, and um, are you, you getting different questions about how to, to utilize space and, and how to upsell experiences? What, what, what are you seeing? Honestly, not so much. 
I think we're seeing some pioneers on this stage, uh, but the vast majority, I don't think, uh, is barely doing anything. Mm. When, when we, we, we looked at a really big analysis, looking at what are the most popular upsells in 2022 versus pre-pandemic, and the top 10 list, top, top, uh, top 10 list is identical. So guests are buying exactly the same things uh, pre-pandemic versus post-pandemic. Is, is that the guests haven't changed or is it is the, the offering hasn't changed? It's both, right? So, so it's, 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 it's from an ever-growing pool of hotels, of course, because we signed up more hotels during those years. But it also showcases that uh, the, the vast revenue generating things and the, 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 vast, the biggest quantity of things that guests are actually buying throughout the customer journey after they book the room is, is very, very close to what it used to be. Mm. Um, so I think that tells us that very few uh, hotels uh, that, that produce a lot of quality or quantity uh, are, are actually pursuing this. Okay. But that said, we have a huge long tail. Like our hotels are, are selling about 8,000 different variations of upsells. <laughs> so we now talked about the top 10, which probably constitutes 95% of all the quantity, but then you have a Massive, massive long tail after that. But uh, so, so my, my answer is, is, is no, but um, we're seeing ma ma many, many more hotels get really, really strong with segmentation. And I think that's also key to, to try to really understand what do your different segments really want out of their stay. And um, I, I love to see hoteliers that dare to go out of this vanilla mode where they are something for everyone to dare to say, I'm going to win that segment and screw the rest. But if I win there, there and loyalty is strong, you know, then, then, I, then I will be really, really well off. We did an analysis just before this event. And if you, if you use something as, we talk about AI, there's so much hype about AI these weeks. But if you do something as simple as segmentation uh, in upselling, so imagine you have an, an, a segmented deal versus a, a deal that is non-segmented, so everyone sees the same. You sell 80% more uh, when it's segmented on average. So, so uh, personalization on, on such a thing is, is actually very simple to do technically, but very few hotels are, are doing it. But the good trend is that more and more are, are moving in that direction. And that's also partly hybrid, right? It's a segment. Let, let me be devil's advocate. Is, yeah. it, is it hybrid or if, well, if I don't you're know. trying to I, be I hybrid, look at you're it trying as a to be too many things and you shouldn't be doing that? Like, I went, um, every, every travel that I've done over the past two years have been with my family and I've been working uh, during those trips. Sure. Don't tell my wife. <laughs> but um, If she didn't realize that, I, mean, I don't <laughs> yeah, know how you're right. hiding that. But. <laughs> no, but, no, but so, uh, so that's just the new normal. Uh, the, the biggest benefit we offer as a company that our employees are the most happy about is hybrid work. Every week, I think we have 20% of the company abroad working from somewhere, Bali, Indonesia, Cape Town. Yeah. Um, so if you're, uh, as a hotelier, can figure out, okay, what do these uh, type of travelers care about, uh, then, then I think you can start to offer bespoke services uh, that, that are relevant, and, and that will up your upselling game for sure. Yeah. The thing I would say is that, you know, if you have uh, uh, hybrid spaces, then you can, you can decide the segmentation more flexibly. Mm -hmm. yep. So, for example, if you have a six-bedded room that we have, you know, two beds like that, and two bunk beds, you can sell it to a family, yep. and the family is traveling at the highest price point, or you can sell it to four backpackers yep. who are sharing that room, if you like, or it could be a group of people going for a gig, or a hen party, or a stag night. So, you know, when you have flexible accommodation, then you're able to segment and also do revenue management more efficiently. Yeah. You know, as a result, you know, I mean, the result is that uh, brands like ours have traditionally outperformed the traditional hotels by 20% in terms of the revenue per square meter because of the ability to segment and have that segmentation be real, if you like. And I, th I think, Hans, you, you, you almost take that concept even further. Um, if I understand correctly, you can explain it, where you sort of look at every square meter to have at least two functions. Or some, you said something about that, right? Like, explain that to us. Well, the thing what we currently are exploring, and we see a huge opportunity, is that uh, before COVID, offices were um, occupied around 60% of the time. But that was measured during the 40 hour per week. After COVID, it's around 30%. Mm. 
Uh, but if you extrapolate that to 168 hours in a week, that means that the space is occupied below 10%. That means 90% unused capacity. 90% of the time the building is there uh, while it's waste. It's waste of uh, build it, uh, it's waste of real estate, it's waste of energy, it's waste of anything. So if you also look to the picture that you previously sent when the hotel space was basically mostly occupied, we feel there's a, there's a huge opportunity also from a sustainability point of view to use space much smarter. So what we've learned, if you now go to Zoku, for example, between seven o'clock and nine o'clock, a lot of people who stay with us, they have breakfast. Then at nine o'clock, the, the members come in, they work during the day and they pay uh, to, uh, for a co-working membership. And at the end of the day, there's a combination of those internationals and locals. They actually blend together. On Friday evening, we got live music, 150 people show up on the top floor. In the weekend, we got brunches with the locals uh, in, the, in the neighborhood. Uh, and our uh, loft product is used during the day at an office, and then you can check out. And then at five o'clock, we put housekeeping in. And then you can even uh, accommodate a person in the room for the night. So we feel that if you can use space much smarter, you can create far more value at lower cost, and even from a sustainability point of view, it's much better. So to go back to Navneet's point, so how do you track performance? Um, it, do you still use RefPAR, or are you, you using RefPAG, or Ref per square meter? What, I don't know. What, well, what? I, I mean, it's very interesting. So uh, the hotel industry is not only a little bit old-fashioned from a technology point of view, but also our metrics. So basically, uh, I very much believe that we will go into a revenue per square meter. That is, I think, a very interesting metric, or even GOP per square meter, or what, what have you. But there should be more focus. If you have unused capacity in your space, I mean, I, a friend of mine, he's a GM of uh, one of the biggest hotels on Fifth Avenue in New York, and it's a huge lobby, and he says, your lobby is fuller than my lobby, and I'm on the, one of the best locations in the world. So I think there is a huge opportunity now. And you see also the bigger brands start to explore that. Yeah. Uh, I mean, companies like us, we have the big luxury. We can always start with a white sheet of paper. We don't have an heritage of thousands of hotels. So we are already thinking about the next big thing. And we feel there's a huge opportunity over there to really facilitate hybrid work from hotels. Why should you close a lease contract for an office for 10 years uh, with a lot of guarantees, uh, do your fit out, and then at the end of the day, the building is only occupied for, say, 20%. Yeah. So we now also have the first uh, uh, companies that uh, basically get, uh, got rid of their office uh, uh, leases, use work remote, bring their teams two times together uh, at Zoku, and for example, last February, we had one Swedish tech company. They closed uh, down their office in Stockholm and Toronto, brought their entire team to uh, our hotel in Vienna, Zoku Vienna, where they basically leased out the entire hotel. And it was a kind of a work from anywhere benefit for their staff just to explore how it's working and living in another city for a full month. Interesting. And, and Kevin, you, um, just to, to go back to the metrics, I guess, you. you we talked before, and, and you said that it, it, was, it was quite a bit of a struggle, right, to, to, to your vision of, of F&B and, and, and how that should become a bigger part of, of your operations. You should be diversifying your revenue stream. Can you, can you just explain why you want a diversification of your revenue streams and, and how much of a struggle that was and what were your main challenges there? Still a huge struggle, huh? <laughs> just to clarify. It's still very, very tough. but. Uh, Yes, yeah, so um, uh, the idea really um, in line with what uh, has been said so far. Uh, the, uh, we, we looked at, uh, I looked at the portfolio of, uh, of hotels that uh, we had back in 2016. All the unoccupied space uh, that was designed, I guess, from the 90s and the 2000s, uh, the lobbies, right? Uh, the lobby that you mentioned from uh, this hotel on the Fifth Avenue in New York. Same, same with us, boutique hotels in Paris. Huh? We had uh, 22 properties back then. Um, and, and so, yeah, the idea was really to try and leverage this, uh, these spaces. but. Uh, not, not go into something too trendy. Uh, I, we, we think we're humble enough not to try and venture out into, into what we consider being another industry, not a segment, but co-working is another industry, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, I've seen many hoteliers uh, trying to transform their lobby into co-working spaces with a very poor Wi-Fi, with a very clunky cappuccino machine, uh, with a, 
uh, you know, like um, receptionists that don't know exactly how to welcome co people that come to co-work. So uh, we didn't know, want to go into something that is not so much of a trend, but at least was a trend for hotel years, right? Mm -hmm. When people panicked uh, seven, eight years ago uh, with their lobbies. So uh, FNB is definitely something that's been around for some time. It's definitely in France something that uh, is part of our culture. And so uh, we, we, we think that uh, uh, creating, investing into something that will become, uh, you know, over time, uh, uh, a valid reason to come in, uh, in our properties is, is very interesting. So yes, we uh, basically did transform some unused space uh, in our hotels that would be empty terraces most of the time in taquerias, you know, like, uh, like very authentic uh, Mexican taquerias. We transformed also, like I said, like some back of the house spaces or lower ground into speakeasies. We transformed some rooms into uh, showrooms um, and, and different uh, um, spaces where partner could actually bring value. And so it actually ended up uh, asking ourselves, we actually ended up asking ourselves the question, how do we monitor all this? And how do we make sure that it makes sense on the PNL, you know, like at the top of the PNL revenue-wise, at the, you know, GOP slash, uh, so middle part of the PNL and then the EBITDA, the bottom line. Uh, and so obviously we have to change the metrics a little bit. We're still not there yet. Uh, and we, it's very, very hard to actually um, try and segment and um, actually size the right perimeter of what you're looking at, especially when you look at payroll. Because how do you allocate a GM's wage, for example, on the hospitality um, revenue stream of your, um, uh, and the room division revenue stream of your hotel, and the food and bev um, aspect of your hotel? Then we're really diversifying a lot into events also. We are talking earlier on about the hotel shutdown that we do twice a year, where we basically bring a huge event called The End. Hotel shutdown, big theme party, people go, come all dressed up. And, um, yeah, and you, should, you should look this up. It's called The End. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it's crazy. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's the end of the world every year. So we changed. Uh, it can't be the end of the world every year, obviously. So it's the end of an era, which changes uh, every, every year. And so, um, yeah, we're going to do uh, two, two events in, in, in some of our hotels this year because we believe a lot in revenue diversification. We believe that uh, Parisians need to consume uh, hospitality. Most of them do not know the hotels of, their, of the capital city of France. But the more they come and consume uh, these hotels through like themed events, cool speakeasies, cool bars, uh, you know, um, spaces that can be occupied in a different way, we think the theme party is a great way to actually bring everyone together. No one judges, judges themselves, no one can know where people are working, uh, working uh, where they're working, where they come from. There's no um, um, identification because everyone's actually dressed up. And so it's a great um, use case of actually transforming a hotel just for one night into something different. We also, um, and, and last example, during COVID, and we're actually carrying on this because we believe in it so much, um, we transformed three of our hotels into um, uh, reception centers, uh, one of which was for uh, women suffer suffering from domestic violence. The other ones was for uh, families, uh, well, homeless families, and the third one was uh, from pe for people suffering from COVID back then. So this third um, hotel, we shut it down since, but we still have these two uh, hotels that, are, that have been transformed. They don't make as much sense, PNL-wise, to be very honest. We didn't do it for this uh, initially. But we understand that, um, once again, here we can blur the lines in terms of segment, venturing out in, into other industries. And now the challenge for us is going to try and understand how, which you know, platform we can, we can bring between different industries. Yeah. Uh, I really believe into like, integrating people that got welcomed into these reception centers and bringing them into our payroll eventually, and our headcount, sorry, eventually. Uh, that would be a perfect use case for us. But yeah, hard to monitor still, to answer your question. But uh, Trefpar is definitely something we, we, we believe in to capture all of what we just discussed into one key KPI. For us, it's Trefpar. Yeah, and I think, I think when you look at the, the stage here, I mean, there's so many opportunities, and there's so much blurring going on, and you can go any direction. How, how as, a, as, a, as a hotelier, do you decide on, on how to, I mean, if you go down to, to the space, how do, how do you decide what use a specific space should have, and, and are you just going to test it, and if it doesn't work, you let it go and do something else, or what, what have you learned, <laughs> suppose, in the, over, over your career? Uh, what I've learned is that, uh, uh, basically, uh, what I obviously hate to see is space being unutilized, yeah. right? That's the first thing. You see, you look at it, and therefore, design is crucial. You've got to design it right, right from day one. Because changing it later, yes, you can adapt it. But if you get it right from the beginning, then you've got that figured out. So in our spaces, for example, I mean, in my own experience with uh, mining, for example, you talk about F&B, there was a big breakfast room where people came and had breakfast because they, they, in mining, we did a lot of school groups, and therefore needed the huge breakfast space. But after 10 o'clock, you saw that slide empty. 
So I've taken over our existing hotel now, which is the first live-in brand. There was a mining girl, so the, the breakfast space is gone. It's just one big space where people can connect. Mm -hmm. they, can, they can work just like, you know, probably I picked a few ideas from Hans, actually. I have to invite you to come and see it. <laughs> but basically, it's a, a co-working space, or it could be a lounge, or a great bar. The guy who's going to run it was sitting right there. Miguel, wave your hand. <laughs> he's the best bar person in Frankfurt. So he's, um, you know, Andre, who's the GM, who's also here, uh, watching this. He hired him because he's going to come and make the best cocktails in, in Frankfurt. Right, Miguel? <laughs> no pressure. <laughs> so, you know, the point is that, this, uh, uh, that you wouldn't get in the, in the, in, in the previous hotel. So the idea is to create something which, is, uh, which customers want, because what they want is to connect with each other. That's what we find, A, and that's, uh, that's the way the hostel idea comes. People want to share. They want to meet other travelers, but they also want to meet people coming in from the city who can come in. So they come to the bar. We have events. We're going to have events as well, so they can come in. There may be a special evening, maybe a special DJ or something, so people come in, they meet other guests. It's about connectivity, using the space for connectivity. We don't have a reception desk. People come to the bar and check in, or they go directly to the room when our key system gets sorted out, <laughs> right? So it can go straight away with their phone and go in. So you sp they save space. So basically, it's about saving space. I'm sure we'll learn a few things as we go along with the new brand, but the key thing is to... Uh, and. Technology is the, is, is, the, is the key thing as well. well I mean, you know, just to, just to, to pull an Oki again, I guess. Yeah. Uh, I mean, to pull an Eric, not, not your, your company. Um, you, you're obviously a technology provider. I guess hybrid hospitality is, is not something people don't go. I mean, yes, yeah, some, some people know they're going to go on a work trip and they want to have some leisure, but some people might be on a leisure trip and, and say, oh, actually, I need to do some work like, yeah. when they're in the destination. So yeah. your purpose of being somewhere might change while you're already there. Yeah. So, so does that change the technology that's needed? Um, does that offer you or, or offer the hotel opportunities to upsell in destination ver versus, I guess, I'm, I'm assuming that now most of upsell is done before the stay, but maybe it's not. I don't know. You can tell me. But is that does, is that changing? Yeah, it's it's the, it's the other way around actually. Like how it used to be, you would go to a tour operator and buy everything from A to Z, and it would all be arranged for you. Yeah. And now we plan as we go, and with Gen Cs coming into play, it will be even more so. Mm -hmm. So I, I always say to hoteliers, and if there are any here in the room, every guest will keep on buying in the moment during their trip. And if you're not selling what they're looking for, somebody else will. So it might as well be you. That's always what I, what I think. And it's a very powerful statement. Uh, so owning your customer journey and being really uh, proactive in, in trying to understand what it is that your customers are looking for, at what time, and uh, to what price point they're, they're, they're willing to pay for something, and then making it very, very easy for them to actually buy such a service. Uh, is critical. We, we have less attention span than a goldfish, in case you didn't know that. We have a goldfish as the oaky kind of <laughs> our company logo? fish. <laughs> <laughs> Not because of that reason, but for another reason. <laughs> but, but we have the less attention span than a goldfish. Goldfish is 9 seconds. We are 8.25 seconds. So you need to, have, to be extremely concise and relevant in, your, in the way that you market and sell and upsell to your, to your guests. Um, so yes, technology is absolutely key. You can't do it without technology. Right. But you need a technology provider that has a lot of data and know-how and, and uh, you know, automation but you also, and, and data so that you're able to personalize. But you also need the savvy hotelier that knows about their product and their guests and their feeder markets and whatnot. And then it's when you combine those two together that you get something really, really amazing. But like, to go, get back to your original point, I went to um, Tenerife for three weeks last year with my family to an Iberia Star hotel, like a resort, you know, primarily for a stay with my family. Mm -hmm. But I had my MacBook, and uh, I could run uh, the company from there for a couple of weeks. And all I did was sitting in there, uh, you know, the huge banqueting rooms, uh, all alone. I mean, certainly underutilized space. However, my, prim primarily, my primary reason was getting away with my family, secondary to work. Uh, and that combination worked, worked flawlessly because they were very, uh, you know, uh, 
uh, they were meet, meeting my needs and whatever I needed there. Was and fast Wi-Fi, no doubt. Uh, they had a fast Wi-Fi. I, <laughs> I could have had a monitor. Like, it could have yeah. been yeah. more ideal, yeah. but I had the pool, right? <laughs> so when sure. I was done with the meeting, I had what, what was mostly important, my family in, in such a place. Sure. So yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. Let's, uh, let's go to, I don't know if there's any Slido uh, questions. I, I, I think Charlie, while well, we'll we wait for that, Charlie of, of um, the Social Hub earlier on stage right. um, talked about, he, he said um, that it was easier to hire, especially young hoteliers, people that are just coming out of education, a lot harder or, or that more traditional hoteliers don't fit his company. Are you, and, and you, are you seeing the same thing um, where in terms of staffing? Depends a little bit on the, uh, uh, on the level. Uh, we yesterday opened Soko Paris, and there's a guy, Jamal, and Jamal only worked in retail, never worked in hospitality before, and we just had a few days of testing. And he was just, I mean, loved by every guest that we had over the past few days. And the main reason behind that was not because he was so experienced, because he maybe made a mistake of putting the plates from the left instead of the right and these kind of things. But he was so genuine, he was so kind. He was the guy you want to immediately introduce to your friends and your family, you should meet him because he's such a lovely guy. Those are the type of people that you actually want to have in hospitality businesses. Uh, however, if at a certain level and you need to become a multi-unit uh, manager and then the financials start to kick in or the legal stuff start to kick in or more complicated IT stack is coming in, then you definitely need the experience. Yeah. But I mean, you can very easily learn somebody to become a barista. You can be uh, very easy to learn somebody to, to check in, but it's more difficult to learn a person to be really nice, proactive, genuine, etc. Yeah, yeah. I know you have some views on this too, but I want to go to... Um, sure. <laughs> some questions as well, uh, because we are already running out of time. Um, what are the technology gaps in hybrid hospitality? What do you need that is different to existing technologies? One of, one of the questions that I actually had as well, I'm not stealing the question, but it is true. Um, we talked about that a little bit before as well. Um, is the technology there today to allow you to do whatever you want can to I do in terms of I hybridity? Can, uh, some simple things. I mean. Uh, um, we are here because some of us are using Muse, right? And I, I, I'll tell you, in our case of hybrid uh, hotel hostels, we are selling beds, not just rooms. And there are only a few providers who can do that for your PMS. One of them is Muse. So we chose Muse. Not only for that, for other reasons, but that's one of the criteria. We, we are, if somebody couldn't do that, then he was not in our list. So in that sense, uh, you know, uh, that's very important for hybrid. You could be able to satisfy your basic requirement, which is to sell yeah. a room or a bed. And, you know, Muse does that very well, so we've gone for Muse. And, and, but it's still focused around the room, I guess. Is there going to be a time where your F&B revenue is more important than your room revenue, or, or you need, I mean, how does, how does that work? Are the systems that are there today, the, the, the idea of everything being around a PMS, is that something that will re remain in the future or is that gonna change? I think that the way the P PMS is organized, I mean, we sell rooms by the night, that's going to change and actually we are collaborating with Muse on something new mm -hmm. that actually more dives into, okay, how, how are you able to generate revenue per square meter, but also how can you use spaces flexible so in your system, can you use a space as a hotel room, as a service department, as a private office, as a meeting room, as an uh, event space? Mm -hmm. If that all can be done uh, through this system and you're able to sell it by the hour, then that would be uh, a game changer. Um, there is another question. Do we need new types of hotel employees? Um, the multifunction hybrid receptionist rolls off the tongue. Community host instead of receptionist. Um, are we, do we have any professors here who want to <laughs> talk I, about education? And I, um, we, over the past seven months, uh, we, we at Oki, we talked to about 50 of our hotel chain customers. And we asked them, what can we do in terms of upselling to help solve your, your biggest problems or whatever you want the most? What do they want the most? More revenue? <laughs> better guest experience, and less staff turnover. Mm -hmm. 
And all of those interviews resulted in one solution that satisfies all three, which actually is a new product we are releasing or unfolding here today together with Muse, nice. which is a recommendation engine for the front office agent. So you have a guest checking in. And the point here is every hotel chain that we have as customers, they have the people at the front line, they have been there for a week, you know, in most of the cases. And we need to make them into upselling superheroes immediately. And how can we do that? By having technology that showcases what's available, uh, how to sell it, et cetera, but also then look at how much commission are they earning. And with a, we're working with a gaming company to provide really cool gamification on the back end, like um, uh, leaderboards, but also you can play something called Hotel Bingo, <laughs> where whoever upsells the room 893 uh, or whatever random number, they get a price, for example. But f that, for me, uh, is a way to um, like fast track the productivity of of frontline employees, because most of our hotel chain customers, they, they just see it as a huge, huge struggle to, first of all, find good employees, uh, and second of all, retain them. And, and by having a, a solution that helps them make more, more money uh, seems to be a very big thing. So from their perspective, not necessarily a need for a new need, but with the talent that is available, how do you make them uh, ramped up quickly and then retain them once they're successful? Okay. I see you've uh, had your employees place another question. You had your plug. <laughs> now also, also tell us what's the top three of upsell items is the last uh, before is, we finish. It uh, is room upgrade. No, sorry. It's breakfast, uh, parking in, in EMEA, and then room upgrades, early check-in, late check-out, uh, dinner deals, spa, and wellness. That's the, that's Great. the list. Right. Thanks very much, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.